in collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambos. This week, we talked to the journalist who exposed the corruption behind the Cyprus Papers. You cannot even launch an undercover operation until you have prima facie evidence of wrongdoing. And we hear from the Minister of Education about the challenges facing our schools. In the private sector, they adapted immediately. In the public schools, uh, it was a small miracle that in uh, two weeks' time, we had distance learning in our uh, high schools. And, uh, of course, there was resistance. We're joined on this week's programme by the man who was behind and indeed led the Al Jazeera investigation into what evolved as the Cyprus Papers. He is David Harrison. David, I want to talk to you in very general terms about investigative journalism as it is now and how it's changed. But first, I'm sure everybody is dying to know what put you on to what became the Cyprus Papers in the first place. Well, strangely enough, the investigation began nowhere near Cyprus. Cyprus wasn't even in our minds when we began this investigation. We were actually looking into an aspect of corruption in the UK. And so how did that evolve into Cyprus? Well, because we started, we had a very similar setup. We had our two undercovers representing a Chinese criminal, and we were attempting to find ways of getting him to get money uh, into the UK, launder it, and or various other things I can't talk about because there's possibly another film about that. It was nothing to do with Cyprus. Um, and he led us um, to another man because we were talking about hiding the identity of our criminal in China. And he volunteered. He said, well, we can do that various ways. He said, we could get him another passport. And we said, oh, OK, all right, tell us more. He told us more. And in front of us, in front of our undercover operatives, he picked up his phone and he called one of his contacts. And he said, I've got a couple of people here said uh, they're looking for a passport for their, 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 their boss. He's a usual story, convicted in China um, in his absence, uh, you know, bribery, money laundering. Can you help? <laughs> Next thing is we're meeting this guy. This, this contact was a former British police officer who makes a brief appearance at the very beginning of the Cyprus Papers undercover film just to show that the story started in London. We moved quickly to Cyprus. So he told us he had a contact in Cyprus contacts in Cyprus who could help us to obtain a passport. So it was only because he had contacts in Cyprus, it could have been Malta, he could have had um, contacts in Bulgaria or Portugal, but it happened to be Cyprus. So this idea that somehow we targeted Cyprus as part of some wider geopolitical plot is absolute tripe. So anyway, that led us to Cyprus, where we met these contacts, and we managed through a succession of meetings and you know, undercover meetings to enter this network of what we call enablers. And we just found ourselves in this murky world of uh, passports for sale. And passports for sale to criminals, and if people who have seen the documentary will know that there are various players involved. There's the estate agent who provides the property. There's the lawyer who does all the work about know your client and the bureaucracy and, and how to get the money into the banks. There's the MP who's now resigned, Christakis Giovanni, who owns a huge property company and has contacts inside uh, in, in the political world. But I bet you uh, didn't expect a high-ranking politician to be in there. That was a surprise. We, it was mentioned to us that there were senior politicians that we would be introduced to, courtesy of Mr K and his, his contacts, but we didn't realise that we would end up in the same room having lunch at, uh, at a table uh, at the home of uh, the MP, Christakis Giovanni, and who was there but the Speaker of Parliament, Dimitris Silurius himself. That was a surprise. So... You got all that information. It has created an absolute uproar, unsurprisingly, in Cyprus. Although, to be fair, I think everybody who's been here for any length of time is well aware that there are a lot of shady business deals going on and, actually, that a lot of our politically exposed persons, as we like to call them, are probably involved to a greater or lesser degree. But let's come on to... But if, if I may just say that, I often hear this when we, we do investigations. People say, oh, yes, well, we knew that was happening. And I say, well, yes, you may have done, but what evidence did you have? 
And I think I was asked this question on, on a panel show discussion on, on TV the other night. What's different about this? We've had stories about passports before. What's different? Why has this made such an, an impact? And the answer is because we were in the room. We were there with this sort of granular detail of exactly how it works from the mouths of the people themselves who were involved in it. And there we come to the whole thing of undercover investigations and the legal framework in which you can operate. Because the way global media runs these days, there's an awful lot of influence from proprietors and so on as to what they do or don't want you to cover according to their own agenda. That's something else. But you have to cover your backs as well, don't you? And particularly with data protection laws and so on. How has this changed the way you approach the job? Well, you're absolutely right. There are very, very strict guidelines and indeed laws that govern what we can and can't do. So, for example, you cannot even launch an undercover operation until you have prima facie evidence of wrongdoing. So that's the first step, is to gather the evidence which we had in various uh, conversations we've had with people, we gather that evidence, and then at every stage of the way, we consult our lawyers. We make sure that everything we're doing complies with um, the Ofcom code. Now, the Off Ofcom is the regulator, the broadcasting regulator in the UK, and Al Jazeera, we, we are, are part of that regulatory framework. And that only allows you to do certain things at certain times. One of the questions I often get asked is, you know, what gives you the right to film people secretly and the answer is you can't just i can't walk around just filming people secretly that's illegal however if we have prima facie evidence of wrongdoing and what we're trying to do is in the public interest and a third consideration is is there any other way you could get that information if you pass all those tests then you can go ahead clearly we ticked all of those boxes we had prima facie evidence of wrongdoing we were within the ofcom rules and also we were absolutely doing this in the public interest exposing corruption, shining or potential corruption, or gathering evidence of corruption, because let's remember, these people haven't faced a judicial process yet, and, you know, they're technically, well, they are innocent until proven guilty. So they deny wrongdoing. What we've done is presented evidence. Now, and can that evidence be used in court? Well, certainly in the UK, the rules have been changing on this, and sometimes they are admissible. That's a ruling for the judge. I think in this case, they would be admissible, certainly in a UK court. We'd have to see what the situation is in Cyprus, which, of course, is governed by EU law. But the third and final the point is, is this, well, is this in the public interest massively? And was there any other way of obtaining this information? Clearly no, because it's illicit, it's hidden, it's secret. They're not going around announcing that they're doing it to people. So we ticked all the boxes, but again, at every stage of the way, we consult our lawyers. Can we do this? Can we do that? Can we not? So, yeah, we were very, very conscious of that, and we adhere very strictly to these guidelines. I mean, our team consists of, you know, very, if I may say so, highly professional journalists. Most of us have worked before. We've worked in national newspapers in the UK or, or in broadcasting companies like the BBC, Channel 4, and we have a bunch of very, very talented and very professional people whose sole aim is to investigate and expose wrongdoing. And I suppose that the real litmus <clears throat> test for a journalist going undercover is when they know to pull back so as not to sound the alarm bells in the target. Yes, the last thing you want is your cover to be blown. It, uh, it ruins the investigation, but also could be potentially dangerous. So, again, there's an enormous amount of preparation that goes into this. First of all, it's choosing the right undercovers. Have they got the right mentality? Are they strong enough mentally to carry this off? Do they have the performance skills? Can they take a briefing? You know, do they know what questions to ask? Can they deliver it? Do they know what follow-ups to ask? But can they keep their eyes on the target and guide the conversation uh, in the way that is appropriate to reveal what we're trying to discover? So all of these things, it's not something you do lightly, and it's certainly not for everybody. Being an actor isn't good enough. It's not enough. It's part of it. But really, it's about mental strength, mental agility. Can you, how do you react when you're in that meeting if it, takes, it goes off in a different direction? Do you pull it back? Do you follow a new lead? All of these, it's like a sort of, almost a form of uh, staying on your toes and being ready to go one way or another to ensure that you expose these people as best as you possibly can. How long have you been doing this? Uh, well, investigations I've done, I spent a lot of years working for national newspapers in the UK, and I did, I've always done investigations along the way, from the 
time I started um, in my first newspaper. And then I did lots of news reporting. I mean, I've covered wars all over the world, and, and uh, I've done a lot of that. And I've always done investigations, again, in the UK, but also internationally. And then moving into television, it was concentrating exclusively on investigations, and I've been with Al Jazeera now for about five years. Now, a lot of people here are suggesting that this is all based on the geopolitical situation that you mentioned a little earlier. What's your answer to that? Well, I, I refer back to what I said about how we, we came across Cyprus by chance. Cyprus was not even on our radar when we began this investigation, and the only reason we came to Cyprus was because one of our contacts had contacts who happened to be in Cyprus. All right, let me put it another way. As we've just said previously, all global media tends to have its own agenda. What's Al Jazeera's? Well, it, I can tell you that our investigation, we have a huge degree of autonomy and independence. And we've done investigations into all sorts of subjects which you might think might not fit, you know, someone's stereotypical idea of an Al Jazeera agenda. We don't have that. We uh, submit our ideas to the head of the unit, who's a former BBC guy. Um, they, the idea that will be will be approved in principle by the Director General, and on we go. And we've never had anybody say, no, don't do that. I remember we did one, um, one investigation into modern-day slavery in the UK. This is the trafficking of people uh, for, for the purposes of slave labour, uh, drugs labour, and sexual slavery into the UK. And we got undercover, we exposed some horrendous situations. And the Director General, uh, powerful Qatari, he had a look at it, and he said, can I make one small change? In one of those scenes where you show the girls, it's just a hint of a bare buttock. Can we just pixelate that out, please? And he was right. It was a, but it was such a minor change, and that was that's the extent to which we are censored at Al Jazeera. So I have to ask you. You're not going to tell me, obviously, what you're working on next. But how do you pick up the first? germ of an idea that says, I think we should look a bit closer at that. Mm. It's a good question. The answer is it comes from different, different sources. Sometimes it's literally just us sitting around a table having a chat. What about this? What about that? I read something. Something you read, it gives you an idea, it sparks an idea. Um, and then so you, you are to uh, some extent relying on other journalists who have pinpointed something anywhere in the world and questioned it and you think, hmm... Well, I guess, in a sense, is, is there any such thing as, as, as a new subject? I mean, possibly not. But it's the idea, I mean, the idea to look into something can do with timing. Is it relevant? Is, is this something that is of concern to a lot of people? Do we feel that there's more? Do we feel this merits investigation? Is it worth getting underneath this? Is there any, anything new to be discovered? Because set? I presume it's a very costly way of doing journalism. It is, it is. And, and we are fortunate in the sense that we have, we are well funded. We are given the two things that every investigative journalist wants, that's time and money. But it's not unlimited. And we have to justify it at every stage of the way, not just legally, but financially. You know, we think we've got a very good lead in Cyprus. OK, how much is it going to cost? And, and how long will you be there uh, for? All of this. It's, uh, you know, there's quite tight controls. But we are fortunate in the sense that usually if we come up with a very strong new lead and we can justify it editorially, then we are given the chance to, to pursue it. We've been talking to David Harrison. He is the lead investigator for Al Jazeera for those Cyprus papers, giving us an insight into something that is actually probably going out of fashion in most of the mainstream media because there are agendas at play. But investigative journalists have a very big role to play in bringing to our attention things that other people would prefer to keep hidden. Keep up to date with events in Cyprus and around the world with the Cyprus News Digest. On this week's program, we're joined by our Minister for Education, Culture and Sport, particularly to talk about digital learning. There was a lot of fuss during the lockdown about whether or not data was going to be compromised if we had 
online learning. The private schools seem to do it very quickly, and the government schools are rolling it out. But what is the situation now, bearing in mind that it looks like this virus is going to be with us for some time, and it could be at any moment that once again schools need to take measures to separate children, either by some learning at home or distancing in the classroom. So it's a welcome to the programme, to Prodromos Prodromo. Can you start by explaining how you got about at the beginning to try and implement online learning? Because I don't think our schools were really prepared for it. The private schools, as I say, within days jumped in and they had no problems. Why did it take us so long? One of the positive aspects, if I may say so, uh, one of the positive aspects of the whole uh, threat, the pandemic, the distress we had, is that uh, for the first time in our education system, we used, uh, on a large scale, uh, digital, uh, digital technology. In the context of last March, when we had the lockdown, in a few days, some weeks' time, we managed to have distance learning for the first time in our public schools. It was not easy. First of all, because of uh, mentality, of the way of thinking. In the private sector, they adapted immediately. In the public schools, uh, it was a small miracle that in uh, two weeks' time, we had distance learning in our uh, high schools, and uh, of course there was resistance. There was Why resistance could... by the trade unions, but uh, from my point of view, it was a very positive uh, development that uh, we showed, we proved, if you want to say, say it in, in this way, we proved that it was possible. So afterwards, uh, we started uh, taking care of our infrastructure, uh, planning uh, the generalization of this uh, project. And at the beginning of this year, we are ready. In all schools, we can have some kind of uh, distance learning. I say some kind because it is adapted. It is adapted to the primary schools, the first classes, there we just uh, need to have a communication between the teacher and its class if they stay at home. In other ages, uh, we have to teach specific uh, lessons and uh, we have distance learning. But first of all, we had to adopt uh, some legislation. We managed to do so, although we had some reactions. Uh, the trade unions uh, tried to emphasize to stress uh, a problem of personal data, privacy. We managed to have an understanding and a good cooperation with the commissioner of the protection of uh, private uh, data. And now we have a legislation and uh, we have a big, uh, huge program in cooperation with the deputy ministry of uh, innovation, uh, technology, digital policy, and the deputy minister himself, Mr. Kokinos, we are doing well, and we have an approval from the Council of Ministers uh, for the equipment. It's not just the equipment. I spoke no. at length a few weeks ago to Kiriakos Kokinos, and one of the things we talked about was the digitalization of the schooling system. And we were talking about the need for many, particularly of the older teachers, to actually become au fait, if you like, with the digital world, they don't know how to teach online. This so is one what dimension, do do? and nobody, we can blame nobody uh, for not being prepared at the age of, let's say, 50, 55 years old. Okay, they, uh, they have not done something wrong, but we have to educate, to inform people, and uh, in our ministry, on the level of the Pedagogical Institute, we have a systematic uh, program of uh, training. First of all, training in the program itself, the MS teams we use, but at the same time, uh, one training uh, on basic skills. 
it is true that uh, part of our uh, educational staff need to be trained. But the majority is able to do it, the large majority, I would say. First of all, we have a, we have a program of, uh, for the digitalization of our system in general and the school management. It's a program that was running, uh, that was running otherwise. Now we try to speed it up in cooperation with the deputy ministry. It's very good. It's a new structure. It's very good and it's very helpful for us having the deputy ministry because for the first time in our history we had the registration of students and uh, pupils in schools this year electronically. And uh, we continue piece by piece to establish electronic digital structure. Can I just ask you while you're talking about that, in the long run, I'm assuming the ministry could save millions because eventually I'm assuming that books, hard copy books, will be not phased out completely, but you certainly won't need to spend the money on providing every single yes, student with a book. Yes. So it'll save a vast amount of money that can then go into further digitalization. And apart from that, of course, the advantage for all the students who are growing up in this technological world to be tech savvy before they leave school. The key factor is this, to provide an environment, a general environment for uh, everybody in school uh, with a digital culture. As a reality, not, not an exception, not a special means to face the pandemic. And uh, it is true that we already transformed our books uh, in PDF form. This is not enough. Uh, we have a plan to digitalize. And this is part of our, uh, one of the four projects we include as Ministry of Education in the recovery plan, the recovery fund, uh, the program of the European Union. One of the four projects is the digitalization of books. So you can have a pan-Cyprian school library that every child in every district can access. And at the same time, we try to form, to create an electronic uh, database uh, with uh, lessons, uh, programs, seminars. We had the license during the last school year, uh, immediately, the, uh, an agreement with the Greek government, because they do have one, the language is the same, but uh, at the same time we try to put in place our own uh, database and uh, an electronic system uh, where uh, everybody can have access to what is the teaching in schools and not only the lessons themselves and the curriculum, but uh, what is important for us uh, is the extracurriculum program. We expect our schools to provide uh, general uh, education on uh, culture, environment, uh, road safety, cyber safety, So all those subjects that we never had the time to address them properly in schools, now we can provide them uh, through digital uh, programs that will be available to everybody at any moment. And I presume as well that it means that children who miss a few lessons can go online and catch up. Go online and catch up. Uh, We also try now to have our own channel in YouTube we try to use all the popular and friendly media uh, to attract our young, uh, young people. But the priority this year, now actually, these days, is to face the problem of some uh, classes that have to stay at home. Fortunately, it's very good that uh, we have... Uh, generally, the conditions are not so bad in Cyprus compared to other countries. We managed to have uh, schools with full attendance, but always we have some uh, cases, uh, sporadic cases here and there, one class in one school that has to stay for 15 days uh, as a precaution at home. We have to provide those uh, students with uh, distance learning. Our schools were ready, were linked, of course, all the schools to the Internet. 
what is the problem? The problem is that the connection was not supposed to be able to carry distance learning. We had uh, conventional uh, networks to have access to the internet, to send emails, etc. Now we upgrade all schools. This is another program with, we run with the Deputy Ministry. So you've got to upgrade the bandwidth, basically, I suppose, at all schools. We upgrade with our provider. We are running this program now. It will be completed uh, to the end of this month, uh, mid-November. All the schools will be able to carry full program for all the students. It's very good. It's what I say that we... <laughs> Being in the need to face the extraordinary conditions, we make uh, big uh, jumps, big steps forward. At the same time, the, the one aspect is the connection, the connectivity. The other aspect is the equipment inside the schools. We run a program and uh, in the next uh, two or three months, all the schools will have the basic infrastructure in all the classes, all the teaching rooms will be able to send uh, the lesson outside. The only other problem, this of course... This is the maximum. We will not uh, need it, but we have to install it, in, to have it in place. And from the moment we have it, uh, connectivity and uh, the infrastructure inside the school, because uh, I have to say that during the last school year, we managed to provide distance learning, but it was uh, in specific conditions. The teachers were at home. So they used their own uh, equipment, their own connection, and it worked. This year, if necessary, we have to do it from school. And not all the schools, we have in Cyprus about uh, 750 schools. Maybe half of them are, are already uh, ready and uh, well equipped. Uh, we have to do uh, the whole part for everybody. And uh, this is what we are running now. Uh, I believe that during this year, all the schools will be able, if necessary, to provide distance, full distance learning. For the partial, the sporadic need for some classes now, we can cover it already, and we are doing so. At this moment we talk, uh, we have uh, one school here in Acropolis, another in the Frifam Augusta area, Another one in Limassol, uh, they have missing classes, classes that stay at home for in uh, quarantine. 15 days, and they support them. Right. The only other problem that I could see occurring is that, particularly in poorer families, and also sometimes that means in rural areas, the kids maybe don't have the equipment mm -hmm. to connect. This is true, and this is one of the aspects that uh, came out uh, on the occasion of this special situation with the pandemic, not only Cyprus. We are talking a lot about it with uh, my colleagues uh, in teleconferences uh, on the level of the European Council. Uh, we faced this problem last uh, school year, and there uh, it was another uh, very, very good uh, performance of our system that we managed immediately to provide uh, to some uh, almost 2,000 families internet connection at home. We had also some donations from the private sector. For example, the internet connection, it was half uh, financed by the ministry and half uh, we had donations. Uh, even by the providers that were interested to make some new clients. Uh, so we provided everybody with connection and uh, a number of uh, 7,400, something like this, of our students. Okay, it's an important number for, the, for Cyprus. It was something uh, about uh, 12 or 13 percent of the population, of the reference population. Uh, we provided them with tablets in order to be able to follow the lessons we had uh, in distance learning. Okay, this year we adapt, maybe some uh, other children, other students at school uh, will be in need. Uh, we will uh, provide them, uh, okay, tablet, one tablet is the minimum. To be honest, I would expect uh, it would be better to give them one laptop. 
So we have targets. Uh, we want to upgrade all the time. For the moment, we can have a functioning system for everybody because uh, distancing people uh, because of the precautions of the hygienic measures and isolating them from education is a disaster. It's what uh, we don't want in any way. We want everybody to participate. And uh, the benefits, because there are some benefits in the distance learning, everybody can organize its time. As you said, ca can have access to the lessons or to the information later on their own schedule. Those benefits should be for everybody. The distance schools, for example, the isolated areas, uh, some rural areas, especially on the mountains, during the winter they will face uh, more difficult conditions. We try to take care of them in a special way and to give them more means. On the upside, of course, if the mountain schools close, which they often do for a few days if the weather's bad, yes. they can now carry on, can't they? Yes, this is another way to facilitate our normal life, apart the pandemic, because we will have the means to face, for example, the special weather conditions on mountains, or uh, to give them some additional programs to those people living there, uh, to provide them with some additional uh, program, uh, more than the conventional curriculum, because they don't live in uh, urban areas, they don't have all the access to culture, and culture or uh, let's admit it, it's a reality, additional private lessons some parents uh, have to buy for their kids, so we need to talk about that some other time yes, because there are far another, too many of those. It's another big question. We've run out of time. Minister, thank you very much indeed for joining me. We've been talking about our education system and particularly the digitalization of that system with our education minister, Prodromus Prodromu. Thank you. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.